So welcome back to our course on transformational leadership, strategy and governance. Having just taken a look at the state of affairs in the world, the complexity of all of that, we're now going to offer you a map that helps to navigate through the complexity. So with all of the information that's out there, everything that gets thrown at us, theories from here, we're aware of so much and via the internet we can find information on all sorts of things. The question is, how do we make sense of it and how do we know what is right in what context? And that's why we at Ubiquity are using the integral framework to help us make sense of all the complexity and navigate our way through. So I expect you'll have come across this in different contexts. Different teachers will explain it in different ways. And it's nice to hear different perspectives on it. And it helps you if you didn't get one piece from one person to get another piece from a different teacher. So I'm going to explain it to you in the way I understand it. And I hope that adds to your uh, perception of what it means to take an integral approach to things. So as we look at this core framework of the four quadrants here, there are four main axes to it. One is the interior, another is exterior, another is individual, and another is collective. So as we zoom in on the individual interior, that points to what is actually going on inside of us as individuals. So the interior dimensions are the dimensions we can't see just with our eyes, that we can't measure with our normal instruments, but they're our subjective experience of reality. So at this very moment, you know, thoughts are going through your heads, you may be feeling certain emotion, uh, maybe your uh, tummy's rumbling or, you know, all sorts of things are going on in your interiors. And that's what this quadrant is pointing to. It's saying that we all have our filters, our way of seeing the world, our values, things which you can't get to by just looking at somebody, but you actually have to talk to them to find out more about what's going on inside of them. So, and that is a, an important, very important part of reality that we don't often pay enough attention to. So that's that upper left quadrant there, the interior of the individual. As we move across to the right, to the exterior, that's still with the individual, but it's our physical organism and our behavior. So it's things, you know, you could go to the doctor, they give you a checkup. Uh, they can measure things without even talking to you. It's things that people can see about you by just observing you, either just by looking at you or with various instruments. And that tells people what your organism is doing, how you're showing up in the world. Um, and so that's the exterior dimension of the individual, also very important because we can hold certain values or beliefs in our interior, but if we don't match those with authentic behavior in the world, if we don't walk our talk and have this personal alignment across our interiors and our exteriors, then there's a lack of congruence in the way we show up in the world. So important to be mapping both dimensions there, what happens in me and how do I actually act, behave and show up in the world. If we move down to the lower left quadrant, then we're at the interiors again, but this time of the collective. So what are the invisible dimensions of us when we get together as collectives in organizations, in families, in bigger cultures? Things like our value, values that we hold together, the kind of unspoken agreements that we have with each other in different contexts. Things, again, which you can't just know by looking at the way a collective behaves, but you have to start asking why people behave in certain ways. What are the things they hold to be true? And that's what gets us to the interiors. They're what motivates a collective, a group, a culture, a society, an organization to do things in a certain way. So you can see why that's very important because if we're trying to change the behavior of something, we need to really engage the motivation for that behavior. So really get into the reason people are behaving in certain ways. So that's the lower left, the interior of the collective, the culture. And then moving across to the right, we move to the exterior of the collective. So all the things that we see around us, the way we collectively organize ourselves, the architecture that we build, the planning of the city, the laws that we make, everything that you can go and study 
about a society, an organization, a community, a family, again, just by observing it, taking a look at it without ever talking to anybody. You just see all of these artifacts that we create in our collectives, which are, of course, heavily informed by the lower left. Those structures and systems that we, that we create on the right are like the house that we inhabit. So they very much define what is possible for us and, and how we go about doing things. So it's an important element to be considering always. We can try to change our shared values and the way we think about things, but we also really need to focus on the structures, the processes, the agreements that we have with each other, um, the way we design our physical spaces. All of those impact the way we live together. So any change initiative, any attempt to create change, needs to take all four of these perspectives into account. If you just try to change somebody's motivation inside, um, but you don't, uh, you don't test that with behavior change, then they can be thinking differently, but acting the same, and you haven't affected the change. Likewise, if you send people on a behavior change program, but you don't deal with the motivation behind the behavior, you're not going to get the change. If people, you send people away on a course and they you know, work on themselves, but they come back to an organization or a community that still has the same values and structures, then they're going to fall back into those collective patterns. So you've got to shift the collective at the same time if you're going to uh, get the individual behavior too. And so what becomes important to look at is not just these quadrants individually, but how they relate to each other. So the personal alignment between my interior reality and my behavior. The values alignment that exists between me and my context. Am I aligned with the shared values that we have in our community or organization, or is there a tension there? Uh, the structural alignment. So how does the systems and structures of our society or our organization reflect the shared values that we hold, are those in alignment or is there some tension in that relationship? And then how does my behavior fit into the structures around me? Because if I'm breaking those rules, then I'm going to get into trouble. So how do we look for that alignment? And as we, as we inquire into the quality of the alignment, take that information uh, as, as Im an impulse to shift something. So what's very important to be aware of is the four, these four quadrants are continually arising and evolving at the same time. So all four of these perspectives, as Ken Wilber would call them, who came up with the theory originally, these are four different perspectives always on the same moment, the same reality. So always there's something happening in me. I have a mindset, a way of looking. I'm behaving in some way. My physical organism is doing something. I'm embedded in a set of collective values and I'm embedded in some kind of structure all the time at every moment. And this just ensures as we hold these four quadrants that we're covering all the bases as we try to make sense of something that's going on and as we try to plan our interventions. So within these four quadrants, things evolve. You can think about evolution from the biggest perspective, from the Big Bang through to where we are now, the different phases of evolution that the planet has gone through, that life has gone through, and that humanity has gone through. And this image that you can see here is a description of the phases of development that humanity has gone through collectively over time and that we each go through as individuals from the moment that we're born. And through that evolution, all four of those quadrants, those perspectives are shifting. So I, I'm evolving my way of seeing the world. I'm evolving in my behavior and my physical organism. We're shifting our collective belief systems and we're creating new forms of civilization and organization that reflect our new way of seeing the world. So if we zoom in a little bit on this, uh, on this pyramid here, we can see these eight levels that are, have these color bands with various descriptions up them. So the bottom base level there, the beige level, reflects really our survival needs. It's the, it's the most basic instinct that we have, the need to stay alive. And if that's not met, then we can forget about any of the others, because if we're not alive, then we can forget about our further evolution in time. So that evolves 
in us, our survival impulse, when we were at that stage of development collectively tens of thousands of years ago, then we were organizing ourselves into survival clans, clans that helped each other to stay alive in the face of the natural conditions that we were facing and the competition with any other clans um, we came into. So that's a very basic need. Now, once that has been met, what happens is that there's space to look up and look around and begin to uh, take steps beyond just meeting our own survival needs. And what, evo what evolved at that phase in our collective development was a tribal society where we bond together with each other to create greater safety for ourselves. And in that process, we create all these rituals, we, we create these ways of being together that um, enhance our feeling of belonging to each other and to the place and fundamentally our sense of safety and security. So that um, we're familiar with, be it at family level or even at nation level, if you go to a, a football or a soccer match and they've got the colors of the team, these are all the rituals that give us this feeling of being a supporter or belonging to a certain group in some way, be it a more a religious group, be it a, a national group, be it a sports team, all these things that really make us feel good about being part of something. It's a very foundational need that we have that goes right back uh, to, our, to the times when we were organizing ourselves in, in tribal societies. So that once that need has been met, that basic need for safety and belonging, it's a very strong collectivist energy. Like it's all about being part of the whole. And if you don't follow the rituals and don't uh, respect the elders, then you're ejected from the tribe. Well, that in us creates a, at some point we've had enough of the collective and what happens is an impulse to emerge as an individual. We, we become aware of the fact that we're not just part of a group, but that we have our own feelings, our own thoughts, our own uh, ways of expressing ourselves. And there's a little rebellion that starts to emerge as we kick away from the collective and try to establish our own identity. Anyone who has children or has worked with young children see it in the, in the terrible twos, the moment where they, where they become aware that actually they have their own power, that they can, you know, they can impact others. If they, if they poke the child next to them, they get a reaction. There's this, there's this kind of awareness of themselves and their own identity. They start to say, I and me. Uh, they start to say yes and no to claim their own rights, kind of in a, in a slight rebellion against the family system. So this was the point in evolution where we started to establish our power as individuals. Um, we, 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 you began to see the emergence of real warrior chiefs and warlords. We organized ourselves in these feudal empires where really the strongest was at the top. It's the, it's the, it's the phase in our evolution where we really... Uh, access our power of, of creativity as an individual to make our stake, to lay it down and go, okay, I'm here and I've got something to contribute to the world. Now, you'll notice there's a swing going on here between collectives and individuals where we've been in this very collectivist tribal context and then we swing across to this strong individualist uh, system that's about your own identity. Well, to, uh, to create greater balance, we then move to a more collectivist system in this blue band, which is all about the conversation that is, if we're all gonna live together in some kind of society or civilization, what are the rules that we need to agree on so that we can actually live together in a society? And that's what begins to emerge at this, at this point, where we, we begin to have a sense of a higher collective purpose. So maybe it's, uh, you know, the, the tribes and the feudal uh, clans start to bond together in nation states. And there's this sense of the nation having a higher purpose that we become subservient to. So we locate ourselves in a kind of hierarchy of order where we look at, okay, here's the higher purpose. Here's the one, the, the kind of one at the top who's closest to embodying that higher purpose. And if it's a nation state, originally it might have been your king or uh, eventually your president. Um, and then if it's a church context, let's say it might be the pope or the priest who are closest to this one truth system that, that you believe in. 
And so all the different religions are basically coming out of this value system, this way of thinking about the world where there's a higher truth and then there's a hierarchy of order in terms of who is closest to the truth. You know your place in the system, you follow orders from on high, and in that sense we create order and structure around us. In a, if it's expressed in a healthy way, it allows us to relax into the system that we're a part of, know what we are needing to do, and know what we're going to be rewarded and punished for, and follow the rules. So that system, which, you know, in our collective history was really pre-enlightenment, where we um, put all our belief in the church, uh, starts to crumble again as the individual starts to feel suffocated in this collective system. And once again, the pendulum swings back towards the individual side. And we start to look up and look around. And around the time of the enlightenment, we begin to see and study life around us and notice that there's the, the church that is telling us one thing and we're being told to take it on faith. But if we study the skies or if we look down through our microscopes that evolved at that time, we begin to discover things about life that the priest wasn't able to explain through their particular belief system. And that was when this, this next system, the orange color here, started to emerge. And it's one we're very familiar with because it's the scientific rational mindset that says really what counts and what's true is what we can see and what we can measure. Not taking things on faith like we used to, but really studying the world, finding out as much as we can, um, striving to become better in ourselves as individuals, to grow, to progress, to evolve, a strong creative impulse that comes back in to that system. Now that's really at the center of uh, a lot of the way our world is organized at the moment. The Industrial Revolution came out of that mindset, this great expansion and growth energy, a sense of continual and never-ending progress that fuels our economic system right now. Now, if that is the kind of center of gravity of our global economy right now, we can also see that there's been some reactions and responses to that, critiques of that system, critiques of that way of thinking, and an attempt to bring in more humaneness into the world. So where rather than just looking at the material stuff, wanting to have more and more, focusing on money and continual progress, people started to say, well, you know, I have feelings. I have, an in, I have a reality that isn't being acknowledged by this very cold system of, of scientific materialism. I'm a human being with feelings and emotions. We need to share those with each other. We need to bring everybody into the equation, not just the one who, who earns the most money who gets to the top, but show a respect for all of life. And so as that value system emerges, you begin to see a sensitivity to the environment, a sensitivity to liberating those who've been oppressed within the current system, a desire to share and include um, in our reality. So that green sensitive self is what, it, is what emerges then. And, and people tend to organize themselves there more in, in kind of community contexts rather than in these and these fast-moving corporate environments. This is more circular, shared community experience. Now, what the original researcher found who, who looked into this, a man called Claire Graves, was at this point in time, there was a big leap in consciousness. And there's a small percentage of the population who's beginning to feel, well, it's all very well, this sharing and this collective thing, um, but we also really need to get stuff done. So one of the traps of this green sensitive self system is that we go round and round in circles, sharing with each other and <clears throat> trying to include everybody's perspective, but it paralyzes us in our action. It's, it prevents us from actually getting things done. So what happens as this yellow integral uh, uh, way of looking at the world emerges is it says, well, all of these different phases that we've been through are important. They all have their place. And the question is, which pieces need to be put together for us to deal with the challenges that we're facing in the world? So rather than being immersed in our own value system as each of the previous ones have been, we start to look at what is needed to engage certain complex challenges that are out there. 
So you can get a sense that the approach that we're trying to take here at Ubiquity and with this course comes from that integral perspective where we're not arguing about what's right or wrong, but we're trying to find out which piece has which bit of truth and what is useful to be able to engage the reality that we're in. Uh, and there have been some very early signs of the next system here emerging, the turquoise holistic self that really begins to see reality as one big um, exchange of energy. So everything is energy, the whole thing connected, even material is energy. It's just a dense form of energy. So many different uh, uh, spectrums, as it were, of energy, but ultimately that reality is all one and connected. And we'll come back to a little bit of that uh, towards the end of the course. So these value systems or these ways of seeing the world, they're deeply ingrained in us. They're like in the background, they're under the water, but they form uh, the choices we make, the way we choose to explain reality, um, the value judgments that we make. And in this slide, you can see how the subject of leadership has evolved through these different value systems as well and across the four quadrants that we looked at. So in here, there are just many examples of um, how, let's say, you know, up in the, the red value system, you've got leadership that's much more about power and uh, Attila the Hun style leadership about making things happen. Whereas, for example, up at the green, if you look across from the green dots, you see approaches to leadership that are much more about inclusion, um, sensitivity. So these lenses that we have shape the way we engage the world through our leadership. And it's not a question of which of these is right or which of these is wrong. It's a question of which of these leadership approaches are most fit for the life conditions that we're in. So if you really are in a survival context where your survival is being threatened, then it's going to be a beige form of leadership that's needed or a red form of really activating your power, just getting things done, not consulting people too much, just getting on with it because there's an urgency about it. Whereas if you're in a context where you've got the kind of complexity that we have in the world today, then that leadership is, is not going to be adequate to the complexity that we're facing. It's, it's only seeing a small piece of the puzzle. It's acting impulsively. It's not seeing the bigger picture. So then you're needing to look at more of the yellow integral forms of leadership that are able to deal with the complexity and then make informed decisions as we go forward. So again, it's not about one being better than the other. It's about which leadership form fits the context within which we're being asked to lead at this time. So to kind of wrap it up in a way, given the conditions that we're in, as we looked at in one of the earlier modules with all these issues coming together, the challenges that we're facing, resilience is an important theme. Resilience being about our ability to deal with stress and complexity and respond and adapt in different ways. And if we, you can take the four quadrants that we looked at and you can compress them into three where you take the upper two, which are really about the individual, put them in one and you get the I, the leadership resilience. So the individual needs to be resilient. And the way we can be most resilient in these contexts is to be able to access the full spectrum of those value systems that I just talked about. So are you able to access the tribal in yourself? Are you able to access the power uh, value system in yourself? Are you able to access the sensitive self in yourself? Because the more that we have integrated those value systems in ourselves, the more we'll be able to engage with them in the world. And they all exist in different contexts, societies, and cultures. So the leadership resilience there, the cultural resilience in the collective, the fabric of our relationships, is that, is that flexible enough so that as our societies, our organizations, our families, our communities get hit by many of these stresses, that we're moving into now? Are we able to rebound, to hold our clarity and not to collapse into a more ethnocentric approach to things where we start fighting others over resources, but we're able to, to maintain our bigger picture uh, approach and find solutions that are adequate to the complexity of the problems? And then 
our structural or systemic resilience, our ability to create forms in our societies and organizations that are able to deal and absorb with stress, uh, access the information, the insights that we get from these stressful moments and evolve as organizations to fit the life conditions as they're moving on. So you can see, hopefully, how this integral approach enables us to map all the different dimensions that are out there, different approaches, different theories, and notice not which is right or wrong, but when is it useful? When is it functional to bring in this approach for this context? And as we do that, it gives us a, a way of understanding the world in a more encompassing way, and it gives us access to multiple different kinds of intervention as we ask ourselves, what's happening in the world and what kind of approach is needed to deal with this particular context. So take some time to digest that. It's a, it's a big picture that's being offered and it's important to allow it to really start to sink in um, before we move on to the next session.